It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. Paul Conway, the co-chair of the symposium, who actually did most of the heavy weight lifting. <laughs> Mr. Conway serves as the chair of policy and global affairs for the American Association of Kidney Patients, who is a kidney patient himself, who has managed kidney disease for over 38 years, including nearly three years on dialysis, and for the past 23 years as a kidney transplant recipient, uh, managed by Dr. Jack. As a policy professional, he has served under the four US presidents, three governors, and in support of five presidential transition team, and his awards include DHS Secretary Meritorious Service Silver Medal. As a patient advocate, he presently serves as the chair of the FDA Patient Engagement Advocacy Committee and as a board member of the Kidney Health Initiative and as a member of the external pa expert panel for the NIDDK and Kidney Precision Medicine Project. And he is the re a recipient of the American Society of Nephrology Precedence Medal. Personally, he's an amazing individual, a great friend to have and a great to work with. Well, uh, it's with great pride that I've had the opportunity to uh, work with Dr. Raj uh, in putting this uh, summit together and our great team uh, at the American Association of Kidney Patients and here at Virginia University. And um, like a lot of patients um, that have kidney disease, uh, you always have a moment where you reflect on what it's all about. And uh, I think pretty early on in your life, you sort out that it's not all about you, uh, that your life has to be in service to others. And uh, Dr. Raj and GWU has uh, given not only myself, but everyone at AAKP who's a patient the opportunity to do that uh, here at this event. Our speakers this morning, and I'll go ahead and ask them to come up on stage as I uh, do their introductions, um, each represent a particular national initiative uh, that's very important to uh, the transformation of kidney disease. Later in the program, you'll hear from the Kidney Precision Medicine Project from Dr. Robert Starr at NIH, but these particular programs this morning that you'll hear from are each uh, weighing in to make a difference. Uh, my co-moderator this morning uh, from George Washington University is my good friend, uh, Dr. Rohan Paul. He's the Assistant Professor of Medicine. Dr. Paul will be conducting the Q&A portion of the panel, uh, and I'll respectfully ask the audience to hold all their questions until all the panelists have presented. There'll be a microphone down here in the center of the aisle where you can pose questions. Um, so joining us on stage, our first speaker uh, in the panel this morning will be Dr. Barry Friedman. He's the chief of nephrology and a strong patient advocate at Wake Forest School of Medicine who, would, who will discuss the APOL1 and the NIH Apollo study. Uh, Dr. Friedman will be followed by two longtime allies of AAKP and kidney patients across America, Mr. Zachary Cahill, the top marketing communication specialist for the Kidney Health Initiative, the strategic collaborative between FDA and the American Society of Nephrology. And he'll be discussing uh, multiple efforts that KHI is doing to bring all the players in the arena together. Uh, he'll be followed by Ms. Rachel Meyer. She's the director of policy and government affairs with the American Society of Nephrology. And we're proud to say she's a recipient of the AAKP Congressional Advocacy Award. Uh, for her efforts on Capitol Hill to represent a patient viewpoint aligned with uh, the nephrology and the kidney profession in terms of making policy and legislation. Ms. Meyer will discuss the High Impact Kidney X Initiative, which was announced not that long ago, but it's a formal partnership between the Department of Health and Human Services and the American Society of Nephrology that is speeding innovation uh, through a competition and a prize. Um, at this time, uh, I'll go ahead and ask folks to come up on stage, and we'll do this in sequence, our speakers, and then we'll do the Q&A portion. So folks, come on up. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers. I want to thank the panel, uh, Mr. Conway, Dr. Paul, um, I'm from Brooklyn. It's great to know AAKP started in Brooklyn. I trained at Kings County Hospital, and I want to thank Dominic Raj so much for putting this together and bringing me here. You know, this is about global innovations, and I can't think about anything more innovative in medicine, much less nephrology, than discovery of a genetic cause for one-third of all the end-stage renal disease 
in the African American population and populations with recent African ancestry, by which we mean people that currently live on the continent of Africa. So I'm here to talk today about that big breakthrough, the APOL1 gene and the NIH Apollo study, um, which will uh, bring it into uh, practice. The big green button is what you should hit for the speakers, the big green button. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's my disclosures. Um, so this is what it's all about. It's about this patient who I've seen patients just like her when I trained in New York, in North Carolina, here in D.C. If you go to any city in the United States, this is a young African-American woman. She's thin. She not, does not have diabetes. She has very little protein in her urine. And she goes to the doctor in her late 30s, early 40s, has mild kidney disease. They tell her, well, don't worry. Your blood pressure's up. It's hypertensive kidney disease. I'll put you on this blood pressure medicine. You'll be fine. And about 10 years later, she's on dialysis because lowering the blood pressure did not cure her disease. And I'm just here to tell you what started me on this mission was patients like her who had many members of their family also on dialysis saying, Dr. Friedman, it's not about my blood pressure. There's something in my family. And about a third of African Americans starting dialysis are labeled as having hypertensive kidney disease. About a quarter of white patients on dialysis are labeled as that. And we've been pushing to reclassify the causes of kidney disease in the US RDS and in registries around the world because they're incorrect and they really impede breakthroughs that will lead to treatment. But what I can tell you now is if, if you look at this curve of the new start rate for end-stage renal disease in the United States, years ago we used to look at African Americans, um, uh, Asian Americans, American Indians, and Caucasians on the bottom and say, well, there must be genetic differences, environmental differences that lead to these markedly different rates of end-stage renal disease. But with improvements in medical care, nearly every ancestral population is clustered around 300 cases of end-stage renal disease per million population per year, except African Americans. And the vast majority of that excess risk for kidney disease in African Americans relates to this single gene two changes in the gene. And it's a fascinating story. Um, and it all started with family clustering of kidney disease. That's what really brought us this to our attention. Uh, this is a publication from our group a long time ago, early 90s, where these are families, and they all have somebody with an A, just like the patient I showed you on dialysis, non-diabetic, thin, very little protein in the urine, thought to have hypertensive kidney disease, uh, but the fact is that they have other relatives with end-stage renal disease in their families from HIV, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, lupus, sickle cell disease. It was not one cause of kidney disease. And we hypothesized that these cases didn't have hypertensive kidney disease, but there was a single overarching gene in these families, in African-American families, that predisposed to end-stage renal disease. And it took about 25 years and lots of DNA sample collections and breakthroughs in genetic technologies that led to this landmark paper that we were fortunate to work on with Martin Pollack's group and Jeffrey Kopp's group. And this is association of the APOL1 gene with end-stage renal disease in African Americans. And it turned out that it was a selection process where people who had one copy of the change in this gene, which we used to call a mutation, now we'd call it a variant because they're so common. It's not a single mutation. It's spread throughout the world or the African population throughout the world. And if you have one copy, you're protected from this parasite, uh, Trypanosoma brucegyridesianza, a cause of African sleeping sickness. And I want you to see if you take blood from somebody with one of the risk variants, it kills the trypanosome. But if you take blood from an African person who doesn't have the kidney variants, the trypanosome lives well. So it turned out with these changes in the gene, people were protected from an early death from African sleeping sickness, multiplied, passed the protective effect on. But if you got two copies of the risk variant in this gene, one from your mother, one from your father, your risk for kidney disease goes up astronomically. And in fact, this is the same story as sickle cell disease. One copy of the sickle cell gene is protective from malaria, so the frequencies went up relatively high because people survived malaria. If you get two copies, one from your mom, one from your dad, you get very sick with sickle cell disease. It's a very similar relationship. And in fact, in Africa, this trypanosoma brucei rhodesiensis parasite is carried by the tsetse fly, and you get stung by the tsetse fly, there's a canker sore on the leg of a young African woman who's been stung, transmitting the parasite. If you had a mutation in this gene, APOL1, which only came about less than 10,000 years ago, you were more likely to survive this and pass the gene on. 
So it's an amazing story. Now, people have been studying animal models of kidney disease, and all my grants were rejected for years because people had rat models and this model and that model. And the fact is the APOL1 gene is only found in humans and a couple of higher level primates. It's not in rodents. It's not in other animals. You can't find it there. It's a different disease. And if you take, uh, oh, excuse me, if you take one of these animals that does not have the APOL1 gene and insert the kidney disease variants, they get kidney disease. And if you insert the normal variant that doesn't cause kidney disease, they're protected. So now, this is not just an association. This is not one of those reports that's going to come and go. This is the gene that causes kidney disease. And when you give it to an animal that doesn't have it, they develop kidney disease as well. So a big breakthrough. And in fact, it's the strongest genetic association in any common complex human disease. It just happens to be in kidney disease nephrology. What's striking to me is that we all talk about sickle cell disease, about 8% of the African-American population has one or two copies of the sickle gene. Mo you know, the vast majority, 7.8% or so, have one copy. 0.2% have two copies. The changes in APOL1 are recent. They came about less than 10,000 years ago. But I want you to know that in the United States, 13% of all African-Americans, more than 5 million people, have two risk variants, one from their mother, one from their father. 20% of them will go on and get kidney disease. Um, another 39% have one copy. So if you add that together, more than half of the African-American population carries one or two risk variants in this gene as opposed to 8% of sickle cell disease. These risk variants are virtually absent in all other populations, European, Asian, Hispanic. When you read papers about APOL1 in Hispanic populations in New York, it's because of admixture of Dominican and Puerto Rican populations with African populations. The APOL1 gene comes from Africa. So it's not really a Hispanic uh, variant. What's interesting is that the risk of getting diseases like focal segmental glomerulosclerosis and HIV-associated nephropathy associated with this gene, the population attributable risk is 70%. What that means in simple terms is if these two changes in the gene didn't come about 10,000 years ago, 70% of all cases of FSGS and HIV-associated nephropathy in the United States disappear. And basically, the rates of non-diabetic kidney disease in blacks and whites would be the same. It's a striking, striking finding. Um, and it's only found in humans, gorillas, and baboons. So every other animal model that was funded ahead of all my grants to the NIH you know, couldn't have found this gene. What's really exciting is I'm about to tell you about the Apollo study where we're going to use it and change practice. But there's actually an antisense oligonucleotide, a way to block this gene with a biological that's being developed by a large company and uh, is, is uh, very exciting for a cure for this disease. A third of all end-stage renal disease in African Americans could go away with a cure. And the spectrum of diseases associated with it, the disease we used to call hypertensive nephrosclerosis, now I call it hypertension-attributed nephropathy. People attribute it to hypertension. It's really solidified glomerular sclerosis. It's in the family of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. HIV-associated nephropathy or collapsing forms of glomerular sclerosis. Sickle cell disease, severe lupus nephritis, and failure of kidneys donated that are then transplanted. That's all part of the spectrum. And I just want you to see these numbers. These are odds ratios for association. These are off the map. I mean, these are like Mendelian diseases. Um, it's never been seen before in common disease. So APOL1 causes about a third of end-stage renal disease in African Americans, contributes to the higher risk of non-diabetic kidney disease in blacks compared to whites, the poorer outcome in lupus nephritis in African American patients, and the shorter kidney transplant survival. And I'm here today uh, to talk about the Apollo study, the APOL1 long-term kidney transplantation outcomes network funded by the NIDDK. Dr. Paul Kimmel, our program officer, is in the audience. And it was his vision and foresight that helped form the study. I can tell you that testing for this gene is now employed by many kidney transplant programs to assess the safety of living donation from African American populations, especially those who have family members on dialysis. The, uh, the Apollo Consortium is assessing the role of APOL1 not only in living donors, but also in deceased donor kidneys from African American donors. And we think that the results of Apollo will better define the quality of the donor organ, changing the way organs are allocated. It's going to improve matching of donor kidneys with recipients, leading to longer function, 
Most importantly, it's going to reduce the discard rate of very good quality kidneys, and you'll be shocked at the data I show you in a minute. That will lead to more transplants, and of course, I think it will improve safety of living donation. So that's what Apollo's mission is, and it's based on this fact. This is deceased donor kidney transplantation, where it's known for a long time that kidney donors of African ancestry or African Americans, those kidneys don't function for as long after they're transplanted in a recipient as do kidneys from donors of other ancestral populations. It doesn't matter if you're a white or a black or an Asian recipient, it matters the, the donor ancestry. Well, nobody knew why, just like African Americans get more end-stage renal disease, why do their kidneys not do as well, until this paper was published by our group. The gene was discovered in 2010. This is a 2011 paper, where we showed that in a single center at Wake Forest, of these are all African American deceased donor kidney transplants. These are the group who had ApoL1 risk genotypes, two copies of ApoL1, and look, at two to three years, half of them had failed. But if you got a kidney transplant from an African American who didn't have two copies of ApoL1, in fact, those kidneys do just as well as kidneys donated by European Americans. And the kidneys that failed in this group were not failing from rejection. They were failing from ApoL1-associated kidney disease. But, you know, single center study, a lot of people had a lot invested in how kidneys were allocated. They poo-pooed it. So we had to keep coming back. We got together with groups at UAB, Emory, more kidneys from Wake Forest, and we looked at 1,153 deceased donor kidney transplants from more than 624 donors at 113 different transplant programs. And you see the same thing. These are all African-American deceased donor transplants. The kidneys that came from donors with two risk variants were twice as likely to fail at six years than the kidneys came from an African-American donor without. So the first point I want to make it's not about African-American kidneys and African-American donation. It's about a gene variant that just happens to be more common in African-American populations. This is a genetic disorder. It's got nothing to do really with race or ancestry or anything like that. It's genetics. The second point I want to make is when we showed this data to all the transplant physicians who believe in things that donor age is important, Sens uh, sensitization, panel reactive antibodies, recipient age, HLA matching, cold ischemia time, standard versus expanded criteria donation. That's the stuff that they're testing for and they believe in. When you put ApoL1 in the model, you can see ApoL1 had a bigger effect than all of those other factors and a lower p-value at the same time as those things were being considered. So ApoL1 is a very powerful determinant of kidney transplant outcomes at least as powerful as all the stuff that transplant physicians are using today. And that's what led to Apollo. Because right now, there's a new uh, kidney allocation system for how deceased donor kidneys are given out. And the big problem that's faced in transplantation is, um, you know, young, healthy people need good quality kidneys so their kidneys can last for their lifetime. And older, sicker folks can get a lesser quality kidney because they're more likely to die of a heart attack or stroke and, and not have a 25, 30 year survival. They're gonna go before the kidney goes. And what was happening is really good quality kidneys were going to older, sicker patients. And those patients were dying with functioning kidneys. So what this system tries to do is guess the uh, quality of that kidney. And it looks at 10 factors, age, height, weight. But look, it looks at ethnicity. If you're an African-American donor of that kidney, it's downgraded because of that old data showing African-American donor kidneys fail more quickly. Well, it turns out only 13% of African-Americans have two ApoL1 risk variants. 87% of them don't have it. Every transplant is downgraded. So working with Bruce Julian and others at UAB, we published a paper about what would happen if you took black race out, or African-American ethnicity out, and you used ApoL1 genotype. And the data are shocking. This is why there's an Apollo study. Remember I showed you the 1,150 transplants we did, that study at six-year follow-up? They were twice as likely to fail in a high-risk donor. Well, this is the data from those same 1,150 transplants. And in the current era, whether the donor has a low-risk genotype, zero or one kidney variants in ApoL1, or a high-risk genotype, these are the guys that are more likely to get kidney failure in their lifetime, their kidney donor risk index was the same about 1.49, 1.47. And those kidneys would do worse than about 70% of all the kidneys transplanted the year before using the current allocation system. But we replaced the current allocation system with ApoL1. And I just want you to see, the low risk group, they don't do worse than 71% of transplants. They're perfectly average. They do as well as half the kidneys in the nation. 
But if you got one of those kidneys from a high-risk donor, they don't do worse than 70%. They do worse than almost 90%. These are the high-risk kidneys. These are low-risk kidneys. They're all being treated the same. Why is that important? Because 85% of the time, the African-American donor kidney is perfectly good quality. Only about 15% of the time are they being downgraded because they have two risk variants. Well, these kidneys can be used and transplanted into older, sicker patients. These kidneys are perfectly good and could go into younger, healthier patients. Af kidneys are being discarded because of the wrong KDPI based on just race when it should be based on biology and APOL1 genotype. So we think that the Apollo study will really improve the outcomes of deceased donor transplantation, reduce discard, more people will get kidney, it will help all of society. What about safety of living donors? And this is a paper by Mona Doshi um, and uh, Emilio Paggio, Jeffrey Kopp. These guys are in Apollo with us. They looked at 136 African-American living kidney donors based on APOL1, and very quickly, 19 of the 136 had a high-risk genotype, 117 had a low-risk genotype, and the kidney function, the glomerular filtration rate, at the time of donation was normal in both groups, but it was significantly higher in the low-risk group, 108, versus 98 in the high-risk group. The creatinines um, are 0 0.89 and 0 0.98. So although they all kind of look normal, when you break them out by APOL1, the high-risk group looked like they have less kidney function. But what happened after donation 12 years later? I want you to know these are 19 people that gave up a kidney to a loved one and were thought to be perfectly healthy. 12 years later, two of the 19 or 11 percent were on dialysis in the high-risk group. There are 117 living donors in the low-risk group. None of them were on dialysis. The other point is, what percent of them had kidney function less than 60 percent? 32 percent of the low-risk group had kidney function at GFR less than 60 12 years later, uh, excuse me, 36 percent. But in the high-risk group, two-thirds had kidney function below 60 percent. So they were on their way to getting more kidney disease. So, you know, a lot of pro centers are testing African-American living donors, and if they have a high-risk genotype, counseling them and saying maybe it's not safe. So people take this as a terrible thing. The number of living donors is going down in the nation. The number of African-American living donors is going down even more. This is a great thing. If you can tell the people who are at risk and safely remove them from the population, other African-Americans are going to feel much better about donating. We think this is going to increase living donation in the African-American population. African-Americans have more end-stage renal disease after donating than any other ancestral population. So we think this will actually improve post-donation. And I'm going to stop there and tell you we've got a great collaborative team. We're very excited about Apollo. But in the spirit of this meeting for uh, basically moving science forward, the APOL1 finding will lead to a cure for a third of end-stage renal disease in African Americans and improved transplantation outcomes. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Zach Cahill. I'm with the uh, Kidney Health Initiative. So today we're going to talk about, um, just going to talk about broadly what the Kidney Health Initiative does and then one of our important initiatives that ties in a lot with the uh, theme of this meeting about moving innovations forward um, and uh, doing it in a collaborative way. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Kidney Health Initiative, um, our mission is to catalyze innovation in collaboration with patients. And um, our primary, this is a quote from our uh, co-chair, Raymond Harris. He's at the Vanderbilt Center, Center for Kidney Disease. For anyone who's um, heard of him, I like this quote because it kind of demonstrates the importance of uh, where key exists at the nexus between industry and patients and physicians. Um, it's kind of unique. Um, key setup is pretty unique because physicians and industry have many opportunities to interact together, but it is unusual to bring patients into that mix. And that's probably one of the uh, key's biggest strengths is not only we're, um, we are not only a convener, but we are really intentional about getting patients involved in our work. This is just, uh, this is our membership. We have, um, 
we bragged that we're the largest consortium in the kidney community, but that is, uh, that's all credit to our members, many of whom are here. And um, we really like um, making sure that we have a really diverse group of people involved. We aren't just representing one group of stakeholders and um, we get involved, everyone that is, has, is an expert in the, um, in the field. So just a couple of big things on key before we, we move on. So the important thing about key is we are, exist in a pre-competitive space. So unlike what um, Rich is gonna talk about later about KidneyX, we like to deal with everyone very far upstream. So we're not talking about specific products or devices or services. We're really trying to create um, an innovation substrate. So um, our founding co-chair, Prabir Roy who is at the University of North Carolina, likes to talk about key as creating a substrate. So basically, we try to cultivate an environment where that is ripe for innovation. So we help, we do work in endpoints, we do work in clinical trial design, things that kind of make all of your jobs easier when it comes to bringing new therapies to market for patients. So we're gonna talk a little bit about patients today. So um, part of what Key does is we have something called the Patient Farm Family Partnership Council. Um, it exists because of the work of Celeska Silla Lee. She was really motivated us and pushed us in a direction where we wanted to um, make sure the patients are integrated into the work that we do at Key. So some of our, I know some PFPC members are here today or will be here later at this meeting. So what the PFPC members do in conjunction with all of our patient organization members is make sure that we include the patient voice in everything that we're doing. This is from our projects to recommendations we make um, to the, direct, the strategic direction of our organization. We really try to make sure the patients are front and center through that whole activity. Um, so David White is our chair. Um, I don't know if he's, he, he's here today, but I know Patrick Gee is here if you want to learn more about uh, what the PFPC does. So Key's bread and butter is projects. So we have about 10 projects going on today. We focus them on a handful of areas. We, talk, we do work in end, clinical trial endpoints, clinical trial design, biologics, collaboration with the government, and working with the patient family partnership. So just this is just a survey of some of the projects we do. Um, these are the, our completed projects. Um, we have, so that 50% have with patients and caregivers, it's in quotes because we have patients and caregivers involved in our projects as well. So that means that they sit in on all of our, all of our project meetings we, that, to make sure that not only the, uh, the project itself has patient voice, but also that the outcome of the project is intelligible to patients. This is what we're doing now. Um, we do, we have a pretty broad portfolio. Um, you can see we do work in, we do a lot of work in rare diseases. We do work in um, IJ nephropathy and FSGS and um, patient reported outcomes. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about one of our bigger projects, the renal replacement therapy roadmap. Um, so when Dr. Raj was speaking earlier today, it reminded me, um, of a quote from William Kolf. So if he says that we were for, if we were going to keep people alive by artificial means, we owe them, the, we have a responsibility to ensure that it's a good life and an enjoyable life. So I think that is kind of the umbrella we could put over a lot of what we're gonna be talking about over the next two days. Um, we're basically, tr we have this problem that Dr. Raj articulated about, we have hundreds of thousands of people that have kidney failure uh, we have hundreds of thousands more people who are going to have kidney failure around the world, and the current system is not good f for them. It's the same thing that they have been treated with um, for the past 50 years. There's been no innovation, and we need to provide different solutions. So this is kind of, for those of you familiar with kidney disease, this is a pretty um, common, um, this is a pretty common slide. Um, for patients, it's very irritating um, because Basically, nothing has changed. And what the Kidney Health Initiative wanted to do was try to articulate some common design requirements and solution pathways so that we could more efficiently 
bring commercially viable um, alternative renal replacement therapy to market. And um, what we're doing, what we took was a um, very it was a solution agnostic. I mean, we were not looking at what would the how to make the path easier for a particular technology. We were looking at a variety of different technologies and kind of what were the, all the common building blocks that we could use to get to the same endpoint of bringing alternative renal replacement therapy to our patients. So the basic. Um, when we talk about including the patient voice, there's a patient committee that was involved in all the different parts of the RRT roadmap. Um, everything about the roadmap is designed to improve patient quality of life. So if you go and read it, and I encourage you to do that on the Kidney Health Initiative website, we, every part of the roadmap is designed to improve patient quality of life. And we did a survey to figure out what parts of um, new artificial kidneys or new kidney replacement therapy would be um, or valuable to patients. And you can kind of just see some of them laid out here. We're also producing a patient-friendly roadmap so that we can easily, the, the roadmap we have now is, is a pretty technical document because it's intended to encourage new interest, investment, and innovation in the field. So for those of you who are not involved in medical field directly, um, this is something that you might be interested in. A um, part, big part of my job is helping to get the roadmap out of the kidney community and into other communities that have the brains and the technology and the incentives to change this field. So we're talking about getting it into the hands of bioengineers and into other medical specialties who might have things that we don't have in kidney disease. So when uh, Paul talks about collaboration, and um, it's not just government that is going to be involved in innovation, um, that's the pretty well encapsulated in how we set up the RRT roadmap. We involved all different players in the community in this project. So just like how Kia is set up, we wanted to make sure that all the important players from the government were there. So we had payers and regulators and researchers involved. We wanted to make sure that all of the cutting edge um, people from academia were involved, and we wanted to make sure the patient voice was involved. So the result is that the roadmap speaks to how we can move RRT forward as is relevant to each of these different stakeholder groups. So this is just a, this is a nice slide, just kind of illustrates what we're trying to do. Again, basically the RRT roadmap is, articulates multiple solution pathways and research strategies to help more efficiently bring new devices and technologies to market. So this is just a little bit more detail on where we, um, on the pathways that we focused on. Um, enhanced style says portable wearable technologies, biohybrids, implantables, and regenerated kidneys. Um, so this is just part of what we're doing. We're looking at adding addendums to the roadmap. The roadmap is intended to be a living document. So we know when you look at these, you say, well, there's not xenotransplantation on here. There's not chimeras on here. Um, we didn't really focus on transplant in the first iteration. This was intended to be a living document that we're gonna to add to over the next couple of years, and especially as new technologies um, become uh, are invented. So if you look at the roadmap, we have all sorts of timelines for different developments. And hopefully we're gonna make additions to the roadmap where we can cross off some of those technologies as new things are invented. So I just wanted to kind of close with putting everything kind of into context. So where the Kidney Health Initiative lives is we try to, again, create an environment that's ripe for innovation. And especially with the roadmap, we wanted to kind of lay out, kind of like define what the ground was where people were gonna work on producing new innovations in dialysis. So this is just the work of, that the ASN does. Um, so this is not everything that's going on in the kidney community. But at ASN, we fund basic research, which is upstream from even where Key is. And at Key, we work in a pre-competitive space with a broad group of, of different stakeholders to create something like the RRT roadmap that we can kind of lay out what the rules are and what kind of what goals we are trying to achieve. And then further upstream, we have things like KidneyX that Rachel's gonna talk about that actually start applying the things, the 
points in the roadmap to specific technologies and actually help bringing them across the finish line for patients. So I'd encourage you to check out the roadmap. Um, we have it on our website at key.asn-online.org slash roadmap. Um, if you have, I know there's some, like there are medical students here, um, faculty at, at GW. The only way that we're gonna be able to actually bring about new, uh, new innovations in this field is if we collaborate outside the kidney space. Um, if you look at all sorts of, if you look at cardio, if you look at the artificial pancreas, those, those devices moved forward because there's collaboration outside of the specific specialty area. Um, that's how we're gonna get innovations created in the kidney community. So I encourage you to, to look that up. And if you're, if you're a patient, also, it's really interesting to look at this and see kind of how much progress has already been made. Um, the RT roadmap is really just a commitment from the kidney community to patients that the status quo is unacceptable and we're actually gonna change something. Um, we've laid out the path of where we're going to do it. And one, one way we, reason we printed it and we made such a big deal about it at Kidney Week last year was we wanna be held accountable. We have timelines on there. We want patients to continue to push us to move the ball forward. So, thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Zach. And a big thank you to Richard Knight, Paul Conway, and Dominic Raj for uh, inviting me and Zach to participate uh, in the, in the symposium and the summit here today. Uh, I'm Rachel Meyer. I'm the Director of Policy and Government Affairs at the American Society of Nephrology. Um, and while I would love to give a talk on policy and advocacy, something we do uh, in collaboration with AAKP extensively, um, what I'm actually here to talk about this morning is Kidney X, uh, ASN's new public-private partnership uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services that, um, as Zach articulated, builds on the work done at the NIH, funding basic and clinical science, and the work done uh, through the Kidney Health Initiative in partnership with the FDA in the pre-competitive space, Kidney X is really focused on um, accelerating innovation through a series of prize competitions that targets um, specific unmet patient needs, of which, as you all know, there are many, uh, and gives uh, in innovators, both within nephrology and outside of nephrology, incentives to come up with creative new ideas to tackle those unmet patient needs and reward them with a series of cash prizes. Fundamentally, as Dr. Raj mentioned this morning, there are 850 million people across the world who are affected by kidney diseases. Um, but we really have not seen substantial innovation in the field. If you look at cancer, we've got immunotherapy. If you look at uh, cardiology, they've got the artificial implantable heart, the LVAD. And in uh, endocrinology and diabetes, they have the artificial pancreas. And we at ASN believe that kidney patients deserve nothing less. Critically, so do our partners at the Department of Health and Human Services. So, in 2018, April, just over a year ago, we formed an official partnership to do just this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, both burden of kidney diseases today and how we're aiming to reduce that through Kidney X. But what I also hope that you'll take away from my talk is the power of collaboration and how public-private partnerships bringing together the private sector and our partners in the federal government can drive change in ways that neither the private sector nor the government can do alone. And it is a, a tool for a relatively small organization like ASN to create transformative change in ways that it couldn't otherwise, including critically through partnership with patients, which underpins everything we do in Kidney X. So here in the United States, about 700,000 people have kidney failure and about 500,000 of those rely on dialysis if they're unable to get uh, the preferred therapy, a kidney transplant. It's high time, though, for us to confront what is an unacceptable moral reality that people who are on dialysis have worse survival outcomes than people with all but two forms of cancer. Just two. So annually, about 100,000 people initiate hemodialysis, and fewer than half of them will be with us in the next five years. So the goal of Kidney X is to try to um, bring more hope to patients through product development and commercialization, improving upon the therapies that we have at our disposal today, whether that's dialysis, looking upstream, looking at uh, diagnostics, improved transplantation therapies to change these grim statistics. 
And I think that's particularly important when you consider that the federal government is now spending about $35 billion a year on the care of these 700,000 people with kidney failure. And that's a remarkable commitment that we have from our federal government to care for everyone with kidney failure. But when you think about the quality of care and the quality of life that we're purchasing with that $35 billion, it's pretty unacceptable. Um, and as was nicely highlighted by uh, Dr. Friedman, this is a disease that particularly affects underrepresented minorities, and that's something we also need to confront. So I'm not going to belabor these statistics. Uh, you're all familiar with them, but our goal is to change them. So uh, the ASN, in many ways, is a very traditional medical specialty society. We publish the leading journals. We have the world's largest scientific conference, Kidney Week, not a food festival. Um, and we have a foundation that gives out uh, grants to promising young scientists working in the nephrology space. But in light of uh, the, the spending and the poor outcomes for patients, the, the concept that they really do deserve better, uh, the ASN leadership has really in recent years to change the way it thinks about its responsibility and role as an organization. That's what led to our first public-private partnership, which you heard Zach talk about, uh, the Kidney Health Initiative and more recently to the forming of Kidney X. It's time for us to show some leadership as a specialty to get both patients and nephrology off the dime of dialysis, and these are two initiatives that we're using to do just that. But we can't do it alone. This is a public-private partnership for very important reasons. Um, as, as partners with the Department of Health and Human Services, um, our, our roles are really complementary. I think I said this earlier, but neither ASN nor the federal government could drive change in this field by itself. You can just imagine the federal government showing up and saying, hi, we're the federal government, we're here to change your specialty. Well, that's going to go over like a lead balloon. And we as ASN saying, hi, we're ASN, you know, we're a 20,000 member organization and we're going to completely transform this field. Oh, but we don't regulate products and we don't pay for them either. That's not really viable. So in partnership, um, we have a much more uh, powerful and viable opportunity to transform the field. Um, so the Department of Health and Human Services span many of the agencies that uh, you heard uh, Paul address in his opening remarks this morning. It includes the National Institutes of Health as the largest funder of biomedical research in the world, uh, really laying the groundwork through funding basic and clinical science. You have the Food and Drug Administration as the market regulator, which um, we also work closely with through the Kidney Health Initiative. And critically, you have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as the really uh, only sort of single payer uh, automatic entitlement for uh, anyone who has kidney failure. A remarkable, a remarkable commitment that also comes with a remarkable responsibility to help drive change in product development. And of course, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, as the, the primary public health steward in our country. And that is fundamentally what we're talking about here. 40 million Americans is an underrecognized public health epidemic. We as ASN bring nephrology expertise and credibility from the leading scientists and clinicians in the field. Uh, with members in more than 110 countries, we can draw on ideas from across the globe. And we've committed the first 25 million to funding this series of prize competitions uh, through Kidney X. Again, um, I think it's, it's so important that we have all of these government partners at the table. And each of these uh, agencies and departments has played a critical role and helping to conceptualize and shape Kidney X. And this is important because, as Secretary Alex Azar said recently, um, one of the reasons that we really have so little innovation is because the incentives across these agencies are not aligned to drive industry and create the right environment and ecosystem for investment to happen in the kidney space. So in partnership with the federal government, we want to change that and make the kidney space a more appealing area for industry to enter. So this is a slide that I think really encapsulates what it is that we're doing through Kidney X. So first and most importantly, we're running a series of prize competitions in which um, ASN and uh, HHS, uh, as Kidney X, identify a specific area of unmet patient need and put out a cash award calling on innovators from a variety of fields to put forward their best ideas, prototypes, uh, eventually, ideally, actual products, and reward the best ones um, with money. Uh, now, this is important because it's a different mechanism than the National Institutes of Health uses through its grant process. Uh, here, we're really looking to reward success in order to fast-track uh, product development for patients. 
We know that the prize amounts we're giving out at this moment in time are not nearly enough to provide the end-to-end -end capital to take a product from a good idea in a lab all the way to uh, into the hands of a patient, which is, of course, our ultimate goal. But through this series of prizes, we aim to create this sense of urgency for these unmet patient needs, um, identify promising ideas, lift them up using the power of both ASN and the federal government, and invite industry and you know, partners in the private sector to come in and invest in these companies and take them all the way to market where they can benefit patients and their families. So that's the first thing we're doing. The second thing we're doing, and this is where the partnership with the federal government is critical, is improving coordination and transparency across the federal government. Looking at things, for example, like parallel review between the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's one way we can uh, speed product development to, uh, to market and reduce costs for industry. So improving coordination across the federal government, clarifying what does the FDA think uh, a product needs to be to determine that it's safe and effective? What does the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services need to determine that something is reasonable and necessary and then, you know, pay for it? Um, so I think if we're successful with point one and point two, we'll achieve our third goal, which is to de-risk commercialization in the kidney space. We know through conversations with existing industry, with venture capitalists, with private equity, that the kidney space today is seen as too risky, um, primarily because the federal government is a single payer, and if they say they're not paying for your product, you don't have anyone who's buying it. So uh, we really aim to de-risk this because we're not gonna succeed at getting new products into the hands of patients without outside capital coming in to invest on behalf of the 40 million Americans who have kidney diseases. Most importantly, most importantly, it's time that we create a sense of urgency to meet these unmet patient needs. For too long, we've been complacent with dialysis as our therapy. And it's time that we as a community stand up and say no more. We're gonna look at investing in ways to slow and prevent the progression of kidney diseases. We're gonna look at ways to improve the patient experience and quality and length of life on dialysis and develop technologies that can uh, enable more people to receive a kidney transplant. So these are the principles that uh, all of the activities that I just went through are really uh, grounded under. And I don't wanna read all of these, but I wanna highlight that patient-driven is at the top of this list for a reason. Uh, it grounds all of the work that we do in Kidney X. It was through patient input and family input that we selected the area for our first prize competition, which I'll talk about momentarily, redesign dialysis. Uh, patients will be integrated into the governance structure, into the governing body of Kidney X. Um, we also require that every individual who submits a project idea to one of our prize competitions has to have already vetted it with patients and caregivers. What we want to avoid here is product developers getting to the very end of the line and going, hey, patients, what do you think? Would this benefit you? Or which color do you prefer? So we want to see meaningful input from patients early on in the product development cycle. We also have patients as judges, so they're actually looking at who should win these prizes we're giving out. Uh, really getting their input at every stage is gonna be critical to the success of Kidney X because if their needs and desires aren't represented, I don't know why we would do any of this in the first place. Um, Zach touched on this, and I think uh, it's another really important point, which is collaborative. We really want to get ideas from outside of nephrology, looking at bioengineering, materials science, nanotechnology, you know, chemistry, people who are thinking differently than the nephrology community has been for the past 60 years. I mean, let's face it. If our members were going to have solved all the challenges of kidney patients by themselves, they probably would have made more progress a long time ago. So we're really looking to be collaborative and bring in new ideas to the space. I mentioned uh, our first prize competition uh, focuses on redesigning a dialysis. So overwhelmingly, um, the patients and families and caregivers that we heard from said, our most urgent problem today in kidney care is dialysis. We want to see some improvements and some changes here. Um, fortunately, we benefited from the work of the Kidney Health Initiative and the uh, Renal Replacement Therapy Roadmap to guide potential innovators um, in this space as to what are the unmet technology and scientific gaps that need to be filled in order to redesign dialysis, whether that's a wearable kidney, an implantable kidney, some other form of an artificial kidney that we haven't even thought of yet. So in phase one, uh, which redesign dialysis is a multi-phase prize, 
we just were looking for some good ideas on paper. We wanted to surface, uh, bring out of the woodwork, if you will, uh, concepts of either component technologies or prototypes that could um, potentially revolutionize dialysis as we know it today. Um, we were absolutely thrilled, as Secretary Azar said, to have received 165 submissions to this prize competition. I think this proves that there is an appetite for the type of um, prize uh, funding model that we're doing here, as well as uh, just so many new ideas and uh, ingenuity that we can tap into. So we awarded 15 teams uh, an initial prize of $75,000 just a couple weeks ago at the inaugural Kidney X Summit here in DC. Um, and we were thrilled that we not only received uh, ideas from a wide variety of disciplines, but also from a wide variety of uh, age groups. We had everyone from the, uh, the group you see in the upper right-hand corner here who are Stanford undergraduates to established people in the nephrology community who've been working um, on this with some great ideas for a number of years. And I'd also highlight, like to highlight here, again, this shows what a true partnership Kidney X is with the Department of Health and Human Services. We had a number of um, HHS officials, including Deputy Secretary Eric Hargan and Chief Technology Officer Ed Simcox participating in the summit, as well as robust uh, congressional support. I think we're at a unique moment in time in the kidney community where we're, we really have put kidney on the map of policymakers, and that's through hard work by groups like AAKP, ASN, and others, uh, that there is a sense of urgency across the federal government, whether that's within the, the Humphrey Building, uh, the White House, or on Capitol Hill, to transform the status quo. Uh, but we're not stopping with phase one. Uh, we are gonna be launching phase two here shortly, where we're looking to move from ideas on paper to proof of concepts or prototypes, and rewarding the most promising of those. Uh, three of them with prizes of up to half a million dollars. Uh, we'll be accepting submissions uh, starting later this year and running through the first quarter of 2020. Redesigning dialysis is our starting point, not our ending point. Eventually, through Kidney X, we hope to tap into, we anticipate tapping into many other areas of unmet patient needs, whether that's drug development, the need for better diagnostics, um, patient-centered tools to help patients um, take command of their own care in, in novel ways that they haven't been able to previously. So there's a lot to come from Kidney X, and we'll be looking to many of you in this room as patients and families to help us guide where we need to be putting our dollars and creating that sense of urgency moving forward. So in the service of uh, doing more than just redesigning dialysis, I wanna just touch a little bit on some of the advocacy work that uh, I, wearing my uh, policy and government affairs hat for ASN have been doing uh, in partnership with the American Association for Kidney Patients on the Hill. Uh, I noted earlier that ASN committed the first $25 million uh, to fund this series of prize competitions. But what we in HHS have envisioned is over the next five years, committing a total of $250 million to Kidney X, matching from uh, the public sector and the private sector equally. We have committed to raising an additional $100 million from the private sector. And we're also lobbying on Capitol Hill, and I know many of you in this room have joined us in doing that, uh, for a congressional appropriation to match that $25 million each year for the next five years. Some shots here from our uh, Spring Hill Day Kidney Health Advocacy Day. And as a result of our efforts on Kidney Health Advocacy Day, we were thrilled to secure uh, more than 60 uh, bipartisan, bicameral members of Congress also calling for $25 million to fund uh, Kidney X's work over the next five years. And uh, in launching any, uh, probably launching any new program is about the toughest thing you can do um, in Washington, D.C. if you're looking to get money for it. Congress is pretty reluctant to invest in the programs they have, and getting a new one on the books is not easy. So we were absolutely thrilled that we made it into the House's um, spending bill for health programs. We didn't quite make it to the full 25, but we got on the map, um, and they've committed $10 million in the House. We're not stopping there. Our organizations are working really as I speak uh, on the Senate side, where they're writing their legislation, uh, hoping to get up to 25. And when those two bills get conferenced and ideally signed into law, um, really give Kidney X some real money to play with in fiscal year 2020. So I'd like to take this opportunity to give a huge shout out to Richard, Paul, and all the AAKP advocates and ambassadors here in the room and across the country 
who've helped us create the sense of urgency on the Hill for this program and the need to invest in the health of kidney patients. We appreciate your partnership. So I want to end with this quote. Uh, the Kidney X inbox received an email a couple months ago from the, the wife of a dialysis patient, and I've, I've paraphrased this a little bit. You all can read it, but I think this really drives at what ASN is trying to do, what the Department of Health and Human Services is trying to do, and that is bring hope to patients who have not had it in a real meaningful way for decades, um, giving people a chance to enjoy their lives in a way that they aren't able to through the currently available therapies. So uh, I look forward to questions during the Q&A here or afterwards. And if you'd like to learn more about Kidney X, I've listed um, my contact information uh, to talk about all of your advocacy interests. And if you'd like to join us, please come find me. And for questions about Kidney X as a program, you can reach either my colleague Connie, the uh, Kidney X project director, or our partner in HHS, um, primary point of contact, Sandeep Patel. Website and Twitter are also up here. I guess I'll leave it at that. And thank you again for the opportunity. First, I'd like to thank all the speakers, and um, at this point, I'll pose some questions to our panel, and um, then we'll open to the floor. And for members of the audience that have questions, if you would be so kind as to utilize the microphone in the, um, in the center aisle. So I'll actually start off with, um, with Dr. Friedman. Um, this is a, a, a two-part question. Mechanistically, do we, do we have any ideas, or do we know how the APOL1, um, APOL1 variant might lead to uh, podocyte injury or podocyte susceptibility mechanistically? And if so, might there, might there be some interventions that we can use to target some of those pathways and perhaps prevent or mitigate um, the downstream, you know, downstream CKD or proteinuria? Thanks, Rohan. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, we do know several potential mechanisms of how ApoL1 hurts kidney cells. And as you heard Dr. Paul say, we think the podocyte in the glomerular capillary is one of the most important cells. Um, the ApoL1 protein kills the trypanosome, that parasite, by unfolding in, a, in an acid environment, inserting into a membrane, the lysosomal membrane of the parasite, and allowing chloride to flow in, and the lysosome ruptures, bursts. That's how it kills the trypanosome. That's why these variants that cause kidney disease were selected for. Well, it's not just the lysosomal membrane. In, in human kidney cells, this uh, ApoL1 protein is a targets membranes throughout the cell. So it attacks the cell membrane, disrupts it, potassium leaks out of the cell, and the cell gets stressed and, and activates stress kinases and die, dies. It attacks the mitochondrial membrane, which we think is one of the most important and happens even before the cell membrane is hit. And when you attack the mitochondrial membrane, that's the powerhouse, the energy center of the cell, and it can lead to cell injury and cell death. It's also very lipophilic, right? So the ApoL1 kidney failure variant proteins uh, are attracted to lipids, and uh, in a non-lipid environment, they're free to do their damage. And by the way, lipids are in the lipid bilayer of cell membranes and, and mitochondrial membranes. So it's a membrane toxin. Now, we think there are ways to target adding lipids to cells so they soak up these toxic proteins. There are rescuers of mitochondrial dysfunction. So we can target some of the mechanisms we think this protein hurts cells. But the best option is there's only two variants, the G1 and G2. You can block those gene variants from making the protein in the first place by attacking it genetically with an antisense oligonucleotide, which in my mind has the best hope, has worked in animal models, and is now being pushed forth, hopefully for FDA approval in a national, international trial soon. Thank you very much, and I think we have a question from the floor. It is a question for Barry. It's a two-part question, of course. That uh, One is, uh, you talked about increased gra allograft loss in people who have uh, two of the copies of the G1 or G2 uh, ApoL1 uh, genotype. Or, or. So uh, the question in, in I the have kidneys is- kidneys from those people, yes. not the people who yes. have the kidney okay. donor. So, well, that's what I want to swing this around. What is the evidence with apolipoprotein L1 in two areas? One is recurrence of focal sclerosis in the allograft, that's not just 
kidney loss or anything but recurrence of the disease? And second, what is the evidence in terms of response to therapy if you have somebody who has focal sclerosis and they happen to have two of the bad G1, G2 genes? So thanks, Jerry Pell. So it's Dr. Pell from Columbia. Um, the first point I'd make is that this is not recurrence of FSGS in the donor kidney, it's development of ApoL1 nephropathy in the donor kidney. So recurrent FSGS is unfortunately a common disease. It, it happens in young people with aggressive FSGS. Their kidney function declines rapidly. They have heavy proteinuria. They get a kidney and day one, there's no protein in the urine, everything looks great. And day three or four, massive proteinuria. That's recurrence of FSGS. That's an immunologic phenomenon. We think there's a circulating factor. Uh, your group's worked on all that stuff. That's different from ApoL1. So ApoL1 is a slowly progressive disease. These kidneys don't rapidly recur. It happens over one, two, three, four, five years that they develop these lesions. And it's not a circulating factor because the recipient makes ApoL1 too, right? The person who gets that kidney. And most of that is made in the liver. Well, it turns out if you're a white recipient of an African-American kidney or an African-American recipient of an African-American kidney, the recipient doesn't matter. So it's not the circulating protein, it's the donor kidney genotype, which gets to Dr. Paul's question, it's in the kidney cell itself that the damage is happening. Therapy. The therapy, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so post-transplant, um, you know, oh, in, in real world therapy, okay. Okay, in native kidney disease, treatment for ApoL1 nephropathy. Well, I can tell you what doesn't work. I can tell you that blood pressure lowering doesn't work in these people. Aggressive use of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, renin angiotensin system blockade. Many of these people don't have much proteinuria. And RAS blockade has its best effect in people with heavy proteinuria, diabetic kidney disease. These people often don't have any proteinuria, which is why they called it hypertensive attributed nephropathy. What does work, however, is people who get, you know, there, there are reports actually came from Columbia, from Glenn Markowitz and Vivette Degatti in your group, People were getting interferon therapy for viral infections, hepatitis, things like that. And they developed FSGS, collapsing FSGS, and nobody knew why, only certain people did. Well, it was the people with the ApoL1 genotype. They're the only ones that get uh, proteinuric FSGS with interferon. So interferon triggers it, stopping interferon cures it. Um, there, you know, there are reports on people who get cytoxan, steroids, uh, you know, calcineurin inhibition for FSGS. People with ApoL1 don't seem to do much better or much worse than the general population, but the fact is the general population does very poorly, which is why we're looking for the novel therapies and antisense oligonucleotides to shut the gene down, which in my mind have the best hope for cure. Please go ahead. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to this panel. This has been um, a good opening and very um, educational. Um, I happen to be a person living with kidney disease, and Dr. Freeman, you gave probably the most impassionate speech that I have ever heard. With everything that was said on this panel this morning, um, and I like the, the ending with the um, letter from the wife, how can we take this information of hope and include it in the educational process. When we go out into um, disparate, underserved, undervalued communities where um, chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease is most prevalent and convey this to folks so that they would get on board or at least have some hope in knowing that um, change is coming. And also, um, Dr. Freeman, a lot of times when people of African descent go and get, um, when they're diagnosed with kidney disease, nobody ever talks about genetic predispositions. So how can we bring that conversation to the table? I might ask Mrs. Meyer to comment on how we can influence the people in Capitol Hill and other stakeholders. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question and thank you for sharing um, sort of your personal story. Uh, I think you hit on a critically important point for our entire community, and that is that 
we do need to bring that message of hope forward. You know, the bad news is that the field hasn't had a lot, had a lot of innovation for the past decades, but the good news is that means the opportunity to improve and change care is so great and so vast. And I think through, um, you know, the work that Dr. Friedman is doing and the work that, you know, many other innovators are doing, we're on the cusp of, you know, getting to success. In terms of bringing the message of hope to communities, I think, you know, if you're a patient or a family member, one of the best vehicles you have is working through this organization right here, the American Association of Kidney Patients. Um, you know, the ambassadors program that they're setting up is absolutely remarkable, and I can attest that they have been uh, so influential in getting Congress to care, not only about kidney X, but about the burden of kidney diseases in general, and the need to do everything from investing in basic and clinical research at the NIH, all the way through to looking at kidney disease as a public health burden. So I would absolutely encourage you, if you aren't already, to get involved with the ambassadors program and to encourage others in your community to get involved. Um, also, you know, follow AAKP on social media. They've got a, uh, their meme game is strong, uh, stronger than ours at ASN. You can also follow us on social media. It's a great way to, uh, kind of stay current with what's happening, whether from a sort of, you know, clinical perspective or a research perspective, or some of the work that we're doing in partnership um, with the federal government through the Kidney Health Initiative uh, and Kidney X. I think um, it, the point I want to end on, though, is the one that you brought up, and that is, I think it's incumbent on all of us to change from a message of nephrology is not an exciting space, there's no hope in kidney disease, which is sort of the messaging of the past, and pivot to a message of inspiration and positivity in a sense that together, you know, patients, health professionals, industry, and the federal government working together, we do have a real opportunity to change things for patients. So whether that's in your own community or interacting with your members of Congress, that's where we as an organization are trying to go. I know it's where AAKP is trying to go, and we need the help of everyone in this room to spread the message of hope. So thank you. Paul, anything to add there? Thanks, Paul. Um, so I like what Rich said about changing the message to one of positivity. So that is something that um, at, at Key we get to work with a lot of industry members, a lot of uh, academic researchers, and they're all really interested in developments like the APL on gene, um, like there's also the Credence trial. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the kidney world. Um, and so often I think we get used to the the narrative of negativity. Um, so I've even been challenging myself recently to try to like think like there's a lot actually going on. Um, and specifically like here we get to see um, from a lot of like from large um, industry partners to like small ones, people are paying attention and are really interested. Um, and we're also, when we talk about like, getting information to patients, um, what Patrick was talking about, like we're, we're be trying to be really intentional about making sure that when we communicate, we're not just talking to doctors and scientists, that, but that we're trying to make sure things are communicated in a way that everybody can understand, and is that's one of the way, tactics we can take to increase awareness about this issue amongst the community. If I could just wrap up by addressing the last question. First of all, it's Dr. Patrick G. For those of you who don't know him, he's very active in the Apollo study on the Community Advisory Council. Uh, Patrick, Dr. Kimmel, I owe you all an apology, by the way. These were not my updated slides. There were some additional Apollo slides that were missing. So I'd just like to say a few things. Number one is Apollo is up and running. Apollo is recruiting from around the nation. Had 260 kidney transplant programs in the nation. Uh, 58 organ procurement organizations, and 70 HLA labs. And just so you know, the op organ procurement organization and HLA labs are doing this voluntarily because of the importance of the project and the strong push behind it and the Community Advisory Council and the leadership's work at the project office. Now, you asked the question about um, what about genetics and speaking about topics like that, especially to the African-American community. All I can say is, you know, I'm a kid from the streets of Brooklyn. You know, I'm not that smart. I don't have a lot of, there's no other doctors in my family. My patient said to me, Dr. Friedman, do you can treat my blood pressure, but my uncle, my cousin, my grandfather, they're all on dialysis. Their doctor told them the same thing. There's something about my family. So, you know, I think honesty is the key. And when you tell people with recent African ancestry, people on the African continent, African Americans, Hispanic blacks, Afro-Caribbeans, I mean, I showed you the numbers for the United States and Africa. This is a disease in the Caribbean, South America, you know, it, there's others. When you're honest and open, 
the, they know there's something else going on. They distrust the medical community. Honesty is the bridge. I think it's very well received relaying this information. It's a sense of relief and a sense of hope with all the new treatments out there. Thank you, and we'll take one last question from the floor and we'll defer the rest of the questions to the breaks. Uh, Rainier Reganathan from GW. This is a question for Dr. Friedman. So uh, you brought up a great point that ApoL1 testing in deceased donor kidneys will open up the field and open up a lot of discarded kidneys. I think on the clinical side, my question is, how quickly can we get ApoL1 testing done on these kidneys? Thank you for that question. So you know every donor you take, you send for HIV, Hep B, and Hep C testing by PCR assay. ApoL1 can be done in the same time. And uh, you know, we, we have, I have a conflict. Wake Forest offers ApoL1 testing. Once the sample's in our hands, the result's there in three hours. So in the same time as your donor, by the way, many kidneys uh, are not taken from the donor uh, until blood testing is done. They're on a ventilator, they may be brain dead, but they're being kept going until the testing's back. You can know the ApoL1 genotype before you ever take the kidneys out. So at this point, what we'd like to do is go ahead and wrap up our first panel, and I'd like to thank our speakers, thank my colleague and co-moderator, uh, Dr. Paul, um, and you will be able to get this uh, session on film, and we will be putting it out. But again, in broad strokes, major national initiatives that are driving change. You've heard it here, here you've heard APOL1, um, you've heard the efforts of NIH, NIDDK, with the Kidney Precision Medicine Project that Dr. Raj talked about, and we're honored to have Dr. Kimmel with us today. You've heard about Kidney X, and you've heard about the Kidney Health Initiative, all broad-based collaborative efforts that are inclusive and centered on patient inputs. So we appreciate your attention. Our speakers will be available during the breaks uh, to talk to, and we'll go ahead and take a couple of minutes here while the next panel comes up, and that'll be led by Richard Knight. Thank you. Thank you.